So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Denale from Euronovia. We are the partner in charge of communication and dissemination for the SCORE Horizon 2020 project. Uh, the webinar is the eighth uh, episode in the SCORE webinar series and it is dedicated to introducing the methodology that we use to assess uh, vulnerability to climate change on coastal areas and in particular in the 10 coastal cities involved in our project. The webinar is led by our project partners at University College of Cork in Ireland. In particular, our two speakers today are Gregorio Iglesias and Emilio Laino, as you can see in the agenda here. So let me give you just a few practical information before we start. First, uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be made available in the next days in the SCORE YouTube channel. And uh, second, due to the Thai schedule, uh, we are not taking questions after each presentation, but you can ask uh, your questions in the Q&A tab or in the chat at any time, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So without delay, I now give the floor to our first speaker, Gregorio Iglesias. Thank you very much, Laura, for your kind pres presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. I am now going to share my screen for the presentation. Very good. <clears throat> yes. Yes, so I'm presenting now. All right, so um, the title of this webinar is Mapping the Baseline Exposure and Risk of Extreme Climate Impacts on Coastal Cities. And um, it is basic, basically uh, the task of Work Package 1 of the SCORE project. The SCORE project uh, is uh, the acronym means Smart Control of the Climate Resilience in European Coastal Cities. So it's all about uh, controlling climate resilience and in the case of our particular work package, uh, understanding the baseline situation in terms of both exposure and risk, baseline situation in terms of climate risks and uh, coastal cities. This, this is uh, the topic of my, my brief introduction. Then I'll uh, give the floor to my colleague uh, Emilio Laino, and then I'll come back for, for a for some uh, final comments. So the, the main objectives, the starting conditions and the key challenges that inform the SCORE project uh, are, are essentially, uh, as I said, the climate resilience of coastal cities in Europe. And in World Package 1, our task is to conduct a high-level assessment of risk. Ten coastal cities were chosen. <laughs> And uh, uh, as, as you can see, these coastal cities are subject to a number of challenges. Coastal flooding, land flooding, coastal erosion, coastal storm surge. These hazards uh, can have a number of impacts, uh, which are described below, such as um, risks to tourism, loss of cultural heritage, damage to commercial buildings, etc. And uh, to mitigate these impacts, there are a number of integrated solutions. Some of them are EBAs, ecosystem-based approaches. Some of them use smart technologies and digital platforms. And an important feature of this core project is the living lab approach. And this core project is very much based on a living lab methodology, uh, which consists essentially of three steps. We switch user roles from consumers to prosumers. We achieve a shorter time between the development of the solutions and the market deployment. And uh, all this is facilitated by a growing penetration of um, ICT solutions, in particular into the daily lives of ordinary citizens, what we call citizen science, sorry, citizen scientists. <clears throat> So the objectives of World Package 1 are, in the first place, to understand the current level of risk that these 10 cities selected for the project 
face due to sea level rise and other climate related hazards. The second objective is to establish a baseline, a baseline uh, using, of course, all the available information about past events in these cities, a baseline for future risk assessments and mitigation strategies. And the third objective is to engage local stakeholders and communities in recognizing and most importantly, perhaps preparing for these risks. Preparing for these risks is, of course, the essential element of the resilience I alluded to before. So we have a number of climate related hazards, storms, coastal flooding, land flooding, coastal erosion, heat waves, um, droughts, etc. We have a number of elements of risk, such as population, uh, the, the um, inhabitants uh, that are potentially affected, residential buildings, uh, industry and commercial buildings, potentially affected, uh, agriculture activities, beach areas and recreation, critical infrastructure such as roads, railways, bridges, etc., and areas of high ecological value. And then we have a scale of risk. The risk can be low, medium or high. And we have a characterization of the risk for the different climate related hazards. Right? Yeah, this is, as you can see, indicated in this uh, graphical table. And to explain a, a, a little better the methodology of the coastal city living labs, it is important to realize that it is based on collaboration. It's a collaborative approach. And this collaboration is crucial, or at least we understand it to be crucial in any climate resilience projects. It is important to engage with the citizens, not only with the stakeholders, not only with politicians, not only with um, specific agencies, but also with the citizens, with the communities. And in this task of engaging with the communities, engaging with the citizens, the CCLLs, the Coastal City Living Labs, are the tool of choice in the SCORE project. They are the central elements for engaging with the citizens, collecting data through them, and in this case they are acting as citizen science, scientists, sorry, and analyzing also with them the results. Uh, you have here in the map the 10 coastal cities uh, that we have in the project. We have Sligo and Dublin in Ireland. We have Dansk in Poland. We have Samsung in Turkey. Piran in Slovenia. Massa in Italy. <clears throat> Villa, uh, Villanova y la Geltrú and the Benidorm in Spain. Sorry, there is also Oarzo Aldea here in Spain. And finally, there is Oeiras in Portugal. Ten coastal cities. And an important aspect of the selection of these cities is that, as you can see, this is occupying part of the... Sorry. As you can see, this... Uh, maybe I can... Yeah. Uh, as you can see, they span different climatic and socioeconomic conditions. We have cities in the northern Atlantic, in the middle Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, in the Black Sea, in Turkey. So cities subject, subjected to very different um, um, maritime conditions and also cities in different countries with very different socioeconomic realities and, and of course, different levels of uh, GDP per capita, and, and that matters. What are the roles of the CCLLs, the Coastal City Living Labs? They are local hubs for gathering, analyzing and implementing project findings in such a way that each CCLL is tailored, adapted to its city. It reflects the local needs, the conditions, 
and the stakeholder input. It is not the same thing to consider a, a city where there is, for instance, a, a thriving uh, fishing activity or a city that is mainly dedicated to tourism. So within coastal cities, we have many different realities, and this is taken into account in the SCORE project by adapting the CCLLs to the realities of each of the 10 cities participating. And in, in, in this connection, I would like to to um, give a special thanks to our colleagues from our package two, who have been really helpful in liaising with the CCLLs for our tasks in our package one. What are the challenges of local data collection? Well, there are language barriers. In these 10 coastal cities, there are uh, uh, different languages spoken. And, and it goes without saying, not all the citizens are fluent in, in English or in, in any other uh, common language for that matter. Um, uh, the data format and uh, uh, heterogeneity has to be has to be taken care of. Um, it is very difficult to find um, homogeneous data sets, so this has to be dealt with. And the data sufficiency and availability. These are the challenges. Uh, it is not easy to obtain data on climate-related hazards. Um, for instance, uh, data relating to um, sea level are, are not so easy to come by at a local level. Uh, the benefits of the collaborative approach um, represented by the CCLLs are very clear in my mind. Uh, we can obtain increased accuracy when gathering data and increased relevance because, of course, the CCLLs are going to be concerned with relevant data. They are going to uh, indicate very clearly if a data set or, or, or some sort of data is not relevant to their city. The second benefit is a stakeholder engagement. We engage with the communities and in the process we engage with the local stakeholders. And finally, another benefit is the fact that we create or co-create is the word. We co-create innovative solutions with the CCLLs. Why are we conducting this high level assessment? Well, the high level assessment of uh, climate related risks is the baseline, the baseline situation to carry out all the other activities in the project. The first thing is to understand the baseline situation. And as you can see, this baseline situation, this baseline exposure and risk informs the subsequent work packages, as you can see in this flow chart. So the, the, the objective is to obtain a broad comprehensive overview of the situation, looking at the specific realities and the specific situations in each of the 10 cities. In one place, we can have a, a significant coastal flooding risk. Somewhere else, we can have a significant landslide risk, etc. And as I said, this baseline situation is the input for the subsequent work packages. So to, 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 to summarize this introduction, we work with the uh, objective of adapting the approach to the specific circumstances of each city, considering the unique environmental, social and economic characteristics. An important element that I haven't mentioned so far is comparability. It is very true that each city has its own hazards, its own risks. But at the same time, we have to come up with an approach that allows us to compare the results from different cities. And, and this is not, not um, trivial. We have very different risks. But our approach must allow to compare the situation in terms of risk 
between them. The third point is the collaborative approach with the CCLLs. And as I said, this forms part of the core, the core ideas of the project. Collaboration implemented through collaboration, uh, stakeholder engagement, citizen and community engagement through the CCLLs, the Coastal City Living Labs. Extensibility to other European coastal cities. While it is true that we are looking at 10 coastal cities, the relevance of the project uh, would be somewhat limited if uh, the results in the methodology were only applicable to these cities. So we strive we strived to create a methodology that is applicable, extensible to other European coastal cities. And, and this means that we can compare the risk, the risk situation, not only between the 10 cities in the project, but also with other cities in Europe, with other coastal cities in Europe. To accomplish this, it is important to balance detail and overview. So we have to strike a compromise between too much detail and the high level perspective, the overview that we want to achieve. It's a matter of really striking a, a compromise. And finally, we need to ensure flexibility. So the, the method has to be specific, but at the same time it has to be flexible uh, so that it can be adapted. To, to other needs and other cities. And this is the end of my uh, brief introduction. I give the floor now to my colleague, uh, Emilio. Emilio, please, uh, I, I'll stop presenting now. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Emilio Lainu. I'm a civil engineer and a PhD student at University College Cork, working on the SCORE project. Today, I will present the four tasks developed in the context of the work package one as part of the high level assessment of risk. Let's start with the literature review. As an overview, the literature review encompasses relevant scientific and technical journals, conference proceedings, official websites of public agencies at regional, national and European level, and other relevant sources of information regarding the impacts of extreme climate events and sea level rise on the 10 coastal cities. Well, the literature review is complemented by the data collected from the CCLS, thanks to the other colleagues from Work Package 2, as Gregorio said, and also with information on relevant past and ongoing projects collected in another Work Package, Work Package 9. The literature review has the purpose of understanding the effects of sea level rise and extreme climate events on the CCLS and identifying related key risk or impacts. This review mainly contains information on the definition of climate related hazards and the related impacts. A summary of the information sources reviewed, the methods for the collection of data and the results of the literature review at global European and CCL levels. In order to, to understand climate related hazards. Climate related hazards encompass a range of natural phenomena that are exacerbated or influenced by climate change. These hazards pose risks to human societies, ecosystem and infrastructure, like in this picture. A brief overview of this picture can be, for example, sea level rise, which mainly occurs due to the thermal expansion of seawater and the melting of ice, ice caps and glaciers. It leads to coastal inundation, erosion, and saltwater intrusion into freshwater sources. Then we have flooding. In this sense, increased precipitation, storm surges, and sea level rise contribute to more frequent and severe flooding events. This can overwhelm drainage systems, inundate low-lying areas, and cause property damage and loss of life. 
we have many different created hazards, not only about the sea. We have heat waves in which rising temperatures amplify the frequency and intensity of this kind of events, posing health risks such as heat stress, hydration, and heat-related illnesses. Heat waves also increase energy demand for cooling and strain of infrastructure. On the other hand, storms are intensified by climate change, leading to stronger winds, heavier rainfall, and storm surges. These events can cause widespread destruction, including infrastructure damage, power outages, and displacement of communities. Another different hazard are landslides, in which heavy rainfall, soil erosion, and slope instability can trigger landslides, particularly in hilly or mountainous regions. These events can result in property damage, loss of life, and disruption of transportation networks. Another very important hazards, but there are very more, are droughts. Changes in, precip in precipitation patterns and increased evaporation rates can lead to prolonged droughts, causing water scarcity, agricultural losses, and ecosystem degradation. Droughts can be also fuel wildfires and exacerbate conflicts over water resources. Well, the most important thing, in my opinion, of all of this is that these hazards are interconnected and can have cascading impacts on urban environment environments. For example, sea level rise exacerbates coastal flooding, threatening infrastructure and displacing population. Another example is that heat waves worsen air quality and increase the risk of heat related illnesses, especially in urban areas with heat absorbing infrastructure. For all these reasons, addressing climate related hazards requires holistic approaches that consider interconnectedness of environmental, social, and economic systems, along with strategies for adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, building at local, regional, and global scales. The methodological approach followed in the literature review involved a four-step scheme. First, global context information was collected from what we can called climate change agencies. These agencies are all kind of institutions, bodies, organizations, agencies, etc., which work on topics related to climate change and climate related hazards. We studied this kind of agencies at international, European, national, and local levels for the coastal cities, for the CCLS. Second, we asked the CCLS for local information on, on the subject in collaboration with our colleagues from World Packet 2. We submitted what we called requests for local information questionnaires, which were of great help for collecting local information and insights. In this process, we found some of the challenges described by Gregorio a few minutes ago related to language barriers and availability of data. Third, we perform a bibliometric analysis through two of the biggest scientific databases, Scopus and Web Science, by means of a query search by, by means of targeted keywords. We look up for general worldwide results, but also for results at European and CCLA levels. Finally, um, we review it green literature, including non-technical media like newspaper, news portal, Etc. in order to fill potential gaps. Moving into the results, the climate related hazards considered in this work are based on a series of authoritative sources and recent research findings tailored to the European context. First, the six assessment report by the IPCC served as a foundational reference offering a comprehensive classification of climate-related events, which underpins the understanding of potential hazards affecting coastal environment. Second, further insights on how to measure these hazards 
by means of indicators, as I will explain later, were informed by the European Topic Center of Climate Change Impacts, Vulnerability and Adaptation. Its technical report, Climate Indices for Europe, evaluates and prioritizes climate related hazards indices based on their significance, adaptation relevance, data availability, and data robustness, as we are interested in. Finally, we made sure that the approach aligns with and builds upon recent studies that employ multiple hazard indicators. For instance, Lung et al. Sorry, and things at all, analyze a range of hazards, including coastal, coastal flooding, temperature extremes, precipitation, flooding, in general, drought, and landslide for regional risk assessment in Europe, not for coastal cities. In summary, we made sure that the methodology is not only grounded in the latest scientific understanding, but also addresses the specific challenges and local concerns faced by coastal cities in adapting to climate change. As I explained before, the results were structured in, into three levels, from global to local levels. In this manner, we built up from a big picture of climate hazards and climate change to understand the local effects for its CCLL. I'm not delving into the results at the global and continental levels, as time is limited, and I want to keep the focus on the CCLLs. The results for each CCR include the identification of the main sources, which provide information regarding climate change and extreme impacts, the relationship between climate related hazards and impacts, that see how the identified hazards have negative repercussions for the CCRs, also the identification of the most dangerous hazards and the most relevant impacts, always according to the available data. This is an overview of all kinds of hazards, but also which are the most relevant. And also, finally, a compilation of past or ongoing projects related to this topic on the, on the city. Our review work include two published papers, not only the, the main report, a symptomatic review and a literature review. Gregorio will talk about the published work at the end of the presentation, so I will just introduce the works. The Scientometric Review focuses on the meta-analysis publication regarding the impacts of climate change on coastal cities. The, this is a meta-analysis. For example, we studied the relationship between publications, authors, citations, research topic, and geographical distribution. The second paper called Extreme Climate Change Hazards and Impacts on European Coastal Cities, a review, as the title says, focus on the content of the literature review itself, and it's more like the score deliverable. We are moving now to the second task after completing the literature review. Once we have made information available, we focus on the particular task of identifying and characterizing the key climate related hazards for each city. So we are not working anymore at global or international levels. We are looking at the CCLS. As an overview, in this task, past extreme climate events are collected for each CCLS through a collaborative process involving them. Consequently, Key climate related hazards are identified and categorized under existing climatic conditions. Maps were also produced to illustrate the results. The most relevant hazards for each city were selected for further investigation. As we are dealing with multiple climate related hazards, I would like to introduce the concept of multi hazard assessment, as we will be talking about it for referring to this kind of assessment. This concept, multi-hazard assessment, has a quite broad acceptance to refer to the consideration of the multiple hazards that have the potential to affect a particular area, in this case, the CCLS. The roots of this concept may be found in the United Nations Agenda 21 for Sustainable Development in 1992, 
and it has been then continually adopted in posterior United Nations events. This, this term is also closely related to the framework of vulnerability and risk assessment, as we will see later. However, currently there are numerous well-established approaches for most hazards when these are considered alone, but a significantly small, smaller number of methodologies deal with multiple hazards. This is a main issue we have found. The picture on the screen shows what kind of maps we produce in this task. In this case, diverse climate events or multiple, multiple climate related hazards were identified in the CCL of Fort Faldea. Some of them affect the whole CCL, while other hazards can be studied at municipality level. The previous map is based on the results not only from the literature review, but also from lists of past climate events collected for its CCLL. These lists include an ID, an identification number, climate event category, a short description, the date, and the affected areas for each event. Here we show an example of some rows from the list for Benidorm. In this case, we have three events of coastal flooding. Uh, the short description, date, and the area. Uh, it's important to have these, these kind of tables so the information can be treated in a systematic way. Uh, in the same way, it's important to, to have a homogeneous format for all the events in order to to properly map them or apply any of the kind of statistical, statistical method. For example, the information from this list were also analyzed through elementary statistics. Here we show an example, and I'm sorry because I did not I did not write the CCL name, but I think it's Benidorm. Another example for Villanova Elagel True, showing the map, the past events list, and a similar graph where we can see the distribution of climate related hazards. We have also published two papers in relation to this work. The first one is closely related to the previous ideas. And we discussed the method, the methodology involving the CCLS in this paper. The second paper is an extension of the methodology to practically any coastal city in Europe, as, we said, as Gregory said before. In this paper, a multi-hazard assessment methodology is provided to collect information on climate-related hazards based on indicators. I will use some images from this work in the next slides. Um, uh, as we learn from this project and the, the issues we have in, in collecting data, we propose a methodology, a more general methodology uh, to deal with this kind of issues. <clears throat> Let's move now to the next task the development of indicators of exposure and vulnerability for the CCLLs. In this task, once we have the hazard component, let's say, indicators of vulnerability and exposure are developed and mapped for each CCLL. The indicators are part of, a, of the high-level semi-quantitative approach to the baseline situation which means under current climatic conditions. In this, in this task, again, available European, national and regional hazard datasets were used as appropriate. The analysis include the, the presence of critical infrastructure and public, residential and commercial assets, as well as social and environmental indicators. Uh, let me explain this 
better. Uh, because we are talking about hazard, uh, exposure, vulnerability, we are dealing with risk. Risk in the context of hazards and disaster management can be defined as the probability and impact of adverse effects resulting from the interaction between hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. So risk, risk is the combination of these elements. And I will break down each component to see how they contribute to the concept of risk. First, hazards refer to potential sources of harm or adverse health effects on a person or community. In our case, in the climate-related hazards, we're dealing with climate-related hazards. Other hazards, apart from climate-related hazards, would include technological hazards such as chemical spills or nuclear accidents or human-induced hazards, like urban fires or acts of terrorism. The nature, magnitude, frequency, and duration of the hazard are factors that influence risk. The exposure considers the presence of people, property, systems, or other elements that could potentially be harmed by hazards. It refers to who or what may be affected by the hazard. Exposure quantifies the extent to which the hazard and vulnerable population properties intersect. For instance, it is usually considered that a flood in an in a inhabited area poses less risk, less risk than a flood in a densely populated region. Vulnerability involves the susceptibility of exposed elements to the hazard and consists of two subcomponents. First, sensitivity, which is the degree to which a system or population is affected, either adversely or beneficially, by hazard occurrence. For example, an elderly population might be more sensitive to extreme temperatures compared to a younger demo demographic. And adaptive capacity, which refers to the ability of a community system or individual to adjust to potential damage, to take advantage of opportunities or to respond to consequences. Higher adaptive capacity, such as improved flood defenses or emergency preparedness plans, can reduce vulnerability. Combining these elements, risk can be understood as a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability in which vulnerability is now understood as a new function of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Thus, risk increases with greater hazard intensity, higher exposure, greater sensitivity, and lower adaptive capacity. In general, reducing risk can be achieved by minimizing any or all of these components. For example, risk can be reduced by decreasing the hazard, through preventive measures, reducing the exposure by relocating communities or assets away from the hazard prone areas, or by lowering vulnerability through enhancing adaptive capacities and reducing sensitivities. In summary, risk is a multifaceted concept that embodies the likelihood, the likelihood and severity of a hazard causing harm, taking into account the number of vulnerable individuals or assets exposed, their sensitivity to the hazard and their ability to adapt to its impacts. We, we will evaluate the elements of risk through indicators, and I will explain why in the next slides. So we will measure the, the components of, has, of risk, hazard exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity by means of indicators, which is very important. Uh, in general, there is a number of tools used to assess vulnerability to climate change on coastal areas. The European Environment Agency summarized this on the technical paper, Methods for Assessing Coastal Vulnerability to Climate Change. The most relevant assessment methods include index-based methods, indicator-based approaches, methods based on dynamic computer models and GIS-based decision support system. According to this 
to this reference. Each method has its own strengths and limitations, depending on the different aspects, taking into consideration the assessment. For example, time and spatial scale, resolution, the drivers or impacts analyzed, the availability of data, the complexity, or even the desired outputs. Indicators or index-based approaches are useful tools for a baseline assessment and the identification of priority vulnerable areas and systems due to their simplified approach. Whereas the methods based on dynamic computer models and GIS-based decision super system are more appropriate for a more detailed quantitative assessment of vulnerability and the identification of adaptation measures. In our case, the CCLS face different climate related hazards and impacts. And furthermore, there is a lack of, avail of available data for some of them. For this reason, we are applying a Facebook semi quantitative approach based on indicators. In general, uh, the indicator based approaches express the vulnerability by a set of independent elements that characterize key coastal issues. These indicators are, in some cases, combined into a final summary indicator. On the other hand, index-based approaches are quite similar to indicator-based approaches and express coastal vulnerability by a one-dimensional and generally unitless risk or vulnerability index. This index, this index is calculated through the quantitative or semi-quantitative evaluation and combination of different, different variables. So, the main difference between both methods can be found in the calculation of a final score, and sometimes these concepts are interchanged. Nevertheless, we would call our methodology as an indicator-based approach. I will explain why we have developed our own methodology in World Package 1 for this task. There are reviews of existing multi-hazard assessment concepts and tools applied by organizations and projects. For example, that, that one by Nagina Toll in 2016. Uh, the literature showed that existing multi-hazard assessment typically fail to make fail to take into account the effects of climate change and to provide a joint understanding of climate impacts, spatial visualization. Comparis comparison between and communication to end users. Furthermore, most of the popular multi hazard assessments are not developed to assess the relationship between climate related events and coastal cities. Notwith notwithstanding, there are, there are examples of proposal of multi hazard assessment intended for coastal areas analyzing climate related events. In general, these approaches apply variation of the coastal vulnerability index, which is a very popular index, and other existing indices. In addition, other existing methodologies cover some climate-related hazards, not all of them. However, these approaches do not, do not focus on coastal cities. It has been observed that, that the scope of the multi-hazard risk assessments developed for coastal cities is usually limited to coastal hazards, such as storms, storm surges, flooding, and coastal erosion, and do not, do not, do not consider other climate-related hazards common to inland cities, such as heat waves, cold spells, droughts, landslides, and forest fires. Also, the geographical coverage of these approaches may be limited. Definitely, there is a lack of an approach that permits a standardized and systematic multi hazard assessment framework in the context of the SCORE project, including all kinds of climate related hazards, not only those specific to coastal areas. Finally, it is of common practice to adapt existing methods to the necessity of a particular assessment. All these reasons have lead us to develop a series of indicators to produce the risk assessment. We have that there are a number of multi-hazard assessments, but in general, there is no assessment uh, which takes all the climate related hazards for coastal cities. Consider the particularities of coastal cities. In this 
in these figures, we show a couple a couple of examples. On top, we have an image illustrating the multiple climate data hazards considered in the CCLS. This, these are the kind of figures from one of our latest uh, papers I mentioned before. Below, we show one example of what kind of indicators have been used to assess the exposure and vulnerability. In this case, the land cover and the land uses for some land flooding areas in Dansk, based on urban atlas data. This kind of indicators are widely recognized for providing fundamental insights into the physical, environmental, and socioeconomic aspects of coastal cities, which are essential for a comprehensive risk assessment. We will see the rest of indicators which were used in the next slides. Well, the main information sources for this task are listed in this slide. I I won't go I won't go into the detail because we I think we are running out of time. But we have data sets for population, land uses, uh, and hazards, for example, landslide, uh, land flooding, temperatures, coastal erosion, and, and digital elevation models. We have also results from previous tasks and contribution from CCL partners, but also existing studies, for example, existing risk assessment and local adaptation plans. Indicators produced in this task include those in this list. We have several elements of vulnerability or risk, as can be physical exposure, uh, population indicators. Uh, we have land cover and land uses for residential uses, industrial, commercial, other kind of critical infrastructure. The transportation infrastructure, we have agricultural land, beaches, dunes, and sand plains, green urban areas, areas of high ecological value. We have green urban areas and other areas not relevant for this study. And we have also indicators for active capacity. For example, cost adaptation plan, national sea level rise preparedness, and we analyze the projection of mean sea level rise for each country. Um, we develop indicators, but apply, apply them for each hazard. This, this is that indicator, for example, the residential area, which is a general indicator, um, is calculated for, exam for example, low elevation coastal zone for assessing coastal flooding. The same indicator, residential area, is calculated for landslide area or land flooding area. This is what this slide, this slide means. In the case of coastal flooding, coastal flooding can be considered one of the most relevant hazards in coastal city due its potential to cause damage to land, ecosystems, and properties, saltwater intrusion, traffic disruption, and even fatality. That's the reason we have so many indicators in this hazard. Some of the main indicators for this hazard include sea level rise, extreme water levels, and the concept of the low elevation coastal zone, as I said before, which is defined as the area below 10 meters, which is also contiguous to the sea. Indicators for the extreme water levels and the low elevation coastal zone are shown in, the, in this picture, where the differences between the CCLs are significant. We can see, for example, we have Dansk, Piran, and Massa with relatively high low elevation coastal areas. This is areas prone to flooding. And for example, we have Benidorm or, or Soldea, in which these areas are reduced. The, the land cover and land uses within the low elevation coastal zone were also studied, as well as the presence of critical elements and indicators of population. Other indicators 
of haptic capacity, as I, as I explained in the previous slide, well evaluated, including the presence of local adaptation plan and information regarding sea level rise management. We have similar indicators for all the hazards. In this case, the indicators for coastal erosion are listed in this slide, encompassing sea level rise rates as shown in the figure. Other water level indicators, the little type hardness, sand areas and areas of high ecological value, which are of high sensitivity. And the same indicator of adaptive capacity as for coastal flooding. <clears throat> the value for mean sea level rise on the screen were retrieved from the application from the spatial agency from the United States, NASA, for the year 2020, where Dansk, again, and Villanova Village 2 ranked the highest with 5.4 millimeters per year, and Sligo the lowest with 2.4 millimeters per year. This is more a curiosity. The analysis of heat waves was interesting. We performed a relatively small assessment for Villanova Village 2 according to the findings from the previous task, where heat waves. Um, were important in existing literature. It was performed based on daily maximum temperatures from the European Drought Observatory. First, we calculated a temperature threshold as the 99th percentile for the 1981-2000 temperature series. This is the temperature threshold to define when we have heat wave. Then heat waves were defined as periods of three consecutive days exceeding that threshold between the years 1981 and 2020. This is a meteorological standard way to define heat waves. In the identification of key climate related hazards, which was based on the literature review and existing technical documents, information from the CCLS, Heat waves were not found to be much discussed for Piran, but if you look at the graph, which shows in red the average number of heat waves per year, Piran clearly stands out. In a similar fashion, the other results in the graph show indicators measuring cold spells, for which we use daily minimum temperatures instead. Drought months, which were calculated based on the SPI index with three month window, a strong wind episodes from winter storms, and rainfall events exceeding 20 millimeters per day. It's not my intention to delve into the technical details for these indicators, but this can be found in the publication. Hi, Emilio, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are quite late with the schedule, so I don't know if you can uh, okay. um, go more quickly for the next slides. Thank you. OK, I, I will skip the, the rest of indicators for the other hazards because they are very related to with the, they are similar and, and you, I think you would idea. Well. Let's move now to the last part of the of this presentation, with formal presentation, sorry, which is the the last the last task. <clears throat> this is once we have all the all the indicators, all the hazards. We, we integrate the results into the assessment of risk. As I said before, we integrate the hazard vulnerability components uh, into the baseline risk analysis. Uh, we produce maps uh, for all the CCS, as I will show later on. And we identify hot spots of risk. I don't want to go into the mathematical details of the scoring methodology, as it is not the purpose of this webinar. The main idea is that each hazard is scored according to its indicators. 
each indicator is itself scored to a traffic light system where within each indicator value is assigned a score of low, medium, or high risk. The methodology for scoring the indicators hinges on the analysis of a diverse array of cases, which were considered adequate for establishing threshold against which the indicators can be evaluated. These thresholds were derived from the maximum and minimum and average values for each indicator. The indicators were classified as I said before under the paradigms of hazard exposure sensitivity or adaptive capacity. The main results of this work include the integration of a broad array of indicators covering hazard, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. The results have been compared with existing studies, providing interesting findings. Preliminary hotspots of risk have been identified. Maps have been also produced. And I would like to finish with some conclusions. The impacts of climate change on coastal urban areas are systemic and interconnected, meaning that it is important for risk assessment frameworks to be dynamic and comprehensive. It is also important to highlight that general risk frameworks are important, but this should be always complemented with local contextual knowledge, as with the CCLS. The methodology itself is well established, but the novelty here relies on the systematic assessment of a wide variety of climate-related risk in diverse European coastal cities. In this sense, the selection of cities within the SCORE project encompasses these cities with different climate zones, levels of urbanization, economic profiles, and susceptibility to different climate-related hazards, as Gregorio mentioned before. The methodology is designed to produce high-level results for baseline scenario. This is very important. And this means under current climatic conditions, not for future climate change scenarios. This means that results are limited and detailed studies should be elaborated, which is also part of the SCORE project. We, are, we acknowledge the dynamic nature of climate risk and the importance of continuously updating data to reflect current conditions. In, in this sense, the exploration of emerging technologies such as such as deep learning models present opportunities for refining risk assessment. Additionally, considering non-traditional indicators such as digital connectivity could provide new dimensions to understanding and enhancing, and enhancing adaptive capacity. That was all from my part. Thank you. Here we have the map, sorry, where we can find the hot spot, the hot spots of risk for Sligo and also the comparison of risk, the elements of risk uh, between all the CCLs. Thank you very much for joining us today. I will give the floor to Gregorio, who will, who, will, who will discuss further about how we are disseminating our results from Web Package 1 and what are our next steps. Thank you so much. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you. I realize we, we are uh, quite, quite late, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll do my best to be very very quick and really go to the main points in yes, one minute or so. In, yeah, maybe just the next steps, uh, what you're doing. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I, yeah. yes. I, I, I think we have already spoken about the publications. Um, uh, we, we are also conducting uh, catch-up meetings for feedback with the CCLLs. We have had a dedicated session at the European um, Geophysical Union Assembly in Vienna. These are the publications that my colleague Emilio mentioned. And so for the next steps, uh, we are currently working on more papers, a cytometric review of multi-hazard indices, and a paper called uh, tentatively Beyond Coastal Hazards, a comprehensive methodology for the assessment of climate-related hazards in European coastal Uh, so, sorry, I think for some reason there was a problem with Teams. I was saying that was the end of my my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have just a few questions in the chat. Um, uh, somebody is asking if uh, uh, you consider the land uh, subsidence and also any consideration regarding salt intrusion to the groundwater these two aspects okay. uh, I, I can respond for for, for that um, 
we do not consider, um, let's say, human related hazards like land subsidence because it's a very complex hazard. Uh, if we include this, this hazard, for example, um, we should also include other technological hazards in, in our opinion. We, we are more focused on just climate related hazards in the in this particular uh, task. I, I, I think that these, these more specific hazards can be considered in the detailed studies. Um, the selection criteria for the 10 coastal study areas, I think Gregorio can better answer this question. This, this comes from the project, from the proposal. This is not the case for our um, work package, let's say, from, from our task. But I think in general, we, are, we have diverse uh, coastal cities. I yes, don't know I, if Yes, thank you, Emilio. Yes, as, as Emilio said, uh, th this is something that was decided at the proposal stage, and the main criterion was to have a sufficient variety in terms of uh, maritime conditions, uh, climatic conditions, and also socioeconomic uh, realities. And I think we we accomplished this with the ten cities selected. There is a question on on the um, adequacy of a city in the South Mediterranean. I, I totally agree, it, could, it, it would have been nice, but the project is a European project and therefore its focus, on, its focus is on, on Europe. And uh, th there is a question on coastal estuaries. Uh, Emilio, would you like to respond yes. to that? Okay, yeah, of course. I think that coastal estuaries are critical areas. And I think you would think the same because we have not only coastal flooding from, from seaside, but we can have this kind of compound events where, where we can have not only coastal flooding, but also at the same time uh, river flooding, uh, which can be very dangerous. Yeah, I think, yes, this, this aspect is critical in, in these kind of cities. And we have also the, the question regarding salt water intrusion to groundwater. This is similar to, to the kind of hazard of land subsidence. We are at a high level assessment um, and this kind of hazards are really complex. Uh, and this would be out of the scope of our humble task, let's say. But there are several other hazards that are also important for cities and that should be studied in, in more detailed studies. OK, perfect. Thank you. I think you covered all the questions. If you have any other question, you can always contact us by email or you can visit our website. We have uh, uh, a page with uh, all the reports uh, from the project uh, that, that you can read uh, to if you want to 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 have more information on these and other topics. Um, and, uh, and and that's it. So the, the recording of this webinar will be uh, available online uh, in a few days. And also we will send you by email a feedback questionnaire uh, related to this uh, webinar. Uh, you can find the link already in the chat. And uh, so thank you again for joining today uh, and for your interest in our project. Um, so we are organizing another webinar on May 21 on uh, a different topic. Uh, we will be together with uh, other three uh, European projects on the um, on the similar topics to present the tools to enhance climate change adaptation in coastal areas. So you 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 have the link to register on our website. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. Have Thank a nice you for, for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.